Um, so yes, tonight, um, you know, it's, it, I, I, I want to say it's kind of a misnomer back to the basics. Um, although it is foundational, uh, Duca can be quite a rabbit hole um, in terms of a discussion. So bear with me. Um, I will probably try to keep this pretty surface layer. layer. Um, it can get rather in depth. Um, but I would also want to allude to what I would hope you'd be able to um, uh, take away as something that could become much more in depth if you wanted it to. Um, and we might discuss that in the future. Um, but for this evening, at least, I should say that <laughs> um, I don't want to be, don't want this to be a dour conversation, um, as as a conversation about Duca may be, um, and and yet. Uh, try to cover some of the things that um, uh, to me are obviously uh, very important, but also foundational to Buddhism on, on the whole. Um, and so uh, I want to bring Dukkha a bit more into the light. Uh, I don't think that we often spend enough time in understanding what that is, what Dukkha is. Um, I think we, or at least I should speak for myself, I too often overlook um, the basic notion of Dukkha. Um, and maybe even try to actively avoid paying attention to it, because obviously it's not a fun thing to, to, to do. Um, but I think Dukkha in and of itself gets a bad rap. Um, what I want to at least do is help change some of our perspective on it or our ideas about it. Um, after all, it is the first noble truth. I feel like that, that uh, has a bit of weight. And I say truth here, satya. Satya um, is like uh, the, the reality. Of, actualities. So this is the first of those um, actualities, and, and that, that life is dukkha. Um, and I'll try to remain dukkha um, as using a, that word, particularly as you see on the top of your handout, there's a lot of different words that we try to use as a means to understand what dukkha, how it's translated, um, and, and because we don't have a corresponding concept in English. Um, and so we try to, there's, there's obviously a lot of ways you can try to depict that, um, but we tend to use uh, suffering and as the definition, and I don't like, like it uh, per se, because especially like, you know, considering the first uh, noble truth, uh, life is suffering, that has a very different tone than life has suffering, for example. Um, and so, you know, when we think of um, life, life also not just how we live it, but the very fact that we are born and die, there is a dukkha about that. And so when we're, when we're talking about this, it's more of a quality, not as an adjective and not as a thing, something. It's not something that happens to us. It's, uh, it, it's not something, uh, it's, it's not a thing. It, it's a quality, it's how we describe things. It's a, uh, uh, a state. And so the, the concept itself of dukkha predates um, Buddhism um, as a whole. Uh, it, it was what a lot of, um, it is in, in the basis of a lot of what now has become the Dhammic religions, Jainism, Hindu, what we now term as Jainism, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism. Um, dukkha itself is the very thing that a lot of ascetics were, uh, were trying to overcome. Um, and so we hear the history of uh, Siddhartha Gautama. Uh, he, he is trying to overcome suffering. This is what he was steeped in. All of this training was around this idea of relieving dukkha. Um, and before Buddhism, it was probably more of a notion of uh, the sensation that one gets or the feeling that one gets when they don't know their own place in their lives, or, or it, and especially in, uh, in a Hindu sense, uh, their relation, how they relate. Um, to the gods, and they're knowing their place. Because once you know your place, then you don't have to worry about it. When you don't have to worry about it, there's no dukkha, right? And so this once um, Shakyamuni Buddha, or at that time, Siddhartha Gautama, uh, uh, sits down under the Bodhi tree, uh, he, he, he's wrestling with this, what would be termed an illness of life. And this is what he's trying to uh, uh, See, by examining the nature of reality, spending the time sitting under the Bodhi tree, the thing that he comes out to express are the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, Three Marks of Existence, all interrelating with dukkha, impermanence, 
non-self as the foundation. And so this idea that 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 Gautama has now seen illness and death in the palace, uh, that is enough for him to say, I need to go and figure out what this is. And that we might argue that that is the impetus that inspired his bodhicitta, to go out and seek something that helps to alleviate that suffering. Okay, so out of his suffering comes the sense of nirvana. And I want to get to that as an overall like prevailing like essence out of what I want to discuss is that out of that dukkha comes something else or can if we choose to go that direction with it. And I would hope you would. But um, so uh, the, the Buddha, it, 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 as they describe a lot of it, we, the sense of dukkha is an illness to our life. So the, med, the, the, the Buddha is offering a medicine as it were. So if we see it as uh, that dukkha is the disease, that there is a reason or origin for this disease, there is the truth of being able to come out of this disease and that the way, uh, and then there is a way to do that. So those are inherently the four noble truths. And it's all dealing with this, how to overcome dukkha stuff. So, what is it about this disease? I mean, he's got to, Siddhartha Gautama is, is faced with illness in old age, and he leaves to go figure it out. And, and he does, and, and therefore, the first noble truth that, that, that life is dukkha weighs heavy. That has a certain kind of importance to it. And so, how we define it, describe it, identify it, um, is important in our own lives. And we can look at, there's numerous sources, sutras, sastras, commentaries, the whole thing on, on various examples, how it's propagated, how it, how it happens, how it's um, passed on. Dukkha is explained in a lot of different ways. But in general, there are three main categories and, and how we try to define it. And so my favorite being the, the uh, Dukkha of Dukkha or Dukkha Dukkha, Dukkha <laughs> Dukkata, um, it is, is um, uh, it's a pain. It's a pain, the pain of pain, the suffering of pain, the stress of pain, right? And, and th this idea that by its our very nature of, of having um, a life, we therefore, um, we die. And because we die, we ascribe certain expectations, uh, assumptions about the time that we have, uh, the process of pregnancy is not that comfortable. Baby is uncomfortable. Mommy is uncomfortable. Let, don't let me get into the process of birth. There's plenty of pain there. Um, Sancho, how's, uh, you know, pain going for you, you know, right? Uh, there, there is living your life, your body naturally. You can't live a healthy life and not experience illness, pain at some point. But by the very nature of our life, our body, there's pain. So that's what a lot of that one has to do with is, is the pain of pain. The second one is really kind of important um, in so much as it, it, the pain from change, uh, impermanence. Um, and and it, I've seen the misery of change, you know. Um, but the, this notion of impermanence being one of the other marks of, of the three marks of existence, um, really underlies a lot of what we'll discuss going forward, but, but this idea that um, because everything changes, we can rely on nothing. And because we can't rely on anything, there's a constant state of fear or apprehension. Right? Uh, I, I think of a bunny who's constantly like, ready for the next thing, right? Constant state of fight or flight. Because there's, there, there's no ease in life. Because everything's in flux. So um, the, uh, the impermanence even underlines our own happiness. We experience something happy, but we're happy to, uh, we experience something happy, but we know it's fleeting. So in and of itself, we know that it's not going to last, and we try to hold on to it as long as possible. Yeah, do that. Okay. And so <clears throat> we, have, we have these sayings of change is hard. Why, why does everything have to change? Why don't you change? 
Why doesn't this light change fast enough? We are never happy with the, with the type of change, what's changing, the rate it's changing, and yet it does. So the, this gets us to the third state, um, third type, and this condition dukkha, or condition state. Um, and so if we really come to this idea of interdependence, and if, if all things, all phenomena are impermanent, then, then uh, ourselves are too. Anything that's conditioned uh, has the quality, can have the quality of dukkha. And so to the point of our, our five skandhas are considered uh, impermanent and therefore um, are subject to dukkha. Uh, the skandhas being um, form, this body, um, the, the sensations of that body, the um, sensations, uh, the uh, uh, perception of those sensations, uh, the, how we formulate those perceptions, and therefore uh, like, have the mental formations from that, habits, and then therefore our consciousness. And all of those aspects are ever-changing. And therefore, how can we trust what we're seeing? How do, what we perceive has this element of, what a pain. <laughs> what, I keep coming back, what a pain. Because, we, you know, it would be really nice if we could perceive all phenomena, you know? If we wouldn't have to be subject to uh, being able to use these eyes or have, touch with these hands, we could perceive all. Wouldn't it be nice to be one with everything? We can't. We can't even see UV light. <laughs> you know, or, or the way that we perceive it shields us, veils us from the nature of reality. That that veil is a pain. <laughs> is a pain. Right? I'll pause here. Questions? <laughs> what a pain. What a pain. <laughs> you know? So, so then you see, you see some other definitions of dukkha there. Um, you know, being apart from the things, that we, uh, things or people that we like, being associated with the things and people that we don't like. Uh, <laughs> right? Uh, not having our wants fulfilled. Oh, darn. <laughs> <laughs> I I called Sensei up one day one day, and I went through a tirade of just complaining, and it was oh my god my life and oh geez I can't believe in the kids and oh uh, work and oh he just silently twenty minutes of just uh huh mm, yeah and I'm looking for some sort of like what do I do Sensei what do I do. Uh, Duke is a bitch, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know. <laughs> Okay, not what I was expecting, right? But no, yeah. Because meanwhile, can I tell you what I was complaining about? No. <laughs> Do I remember what that was? No, I know. Like, I knew it was important at the time, but right. So, this idea, generally speaking, of dukkha, it, you know, it's it's an endemic quality to our experiences. And if we can start to call it out for what it is, and at least identify it, it's dukkha, right? It's just a state like any other. It comes, it goes, we experience it more or less. So if we take it as an inevitable, we can develop a different relationship to it. We get to choose how much we want to swim around in it, as it were. When we can experience it and call it out for what it is, we can contextualize it, appraise it, and hopefully respond to it accordingly. Hopefully. We become attached to the fleeting things, sensations, emotions, and we are constantly seeking gratification or running away from displeasure. And when my... <laughs> Because when my kids play, I lament. They're growing up while we're having this happy experience of wrestling on the floor or what have you. 
but I also want time to pass way more swiftly as they're shrieking at the tops and pulling out my eardrums. What if I was to just say, simply say, I'm going to enjoy this moment and let it go when it passes? Or, man, I love to see how they express their joy with their incessant shrieking. Anyway, um, it's the same. I still, my eardrums still hurt. But I'm trying to look at it from a better, more different, less, less dukkha-ish perspective. So we should change our perspective of dukkha and so that we can explore its nature. And therefore, and by, 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 um, by uh, vicariously exploring the nature of impermanence and non-self. Marks of existence. Can we start to bend the definition of dukkha? You know, if we if, if it if it really becomes helpful, beneficial to us, to you know, if I experience that shrieking, it's like, oh, isn't that nice? Is that dukkha anymore? Like, what if we start to kind of actually not be a pain? Is that dukkha? And if it's not, is that nirvana? I mean, I wouldn't say so, but you know, hey, it's a nice mental thought. Because whatever is not dukkha, well, no, I should say, whatever is not nirvana is dukkha. So I'm not saying you get, because eliminating, oh boy. Uh, no, no, let's, let's decrease its intensity. Let's decrease its, its uh, frequency. You know, if we think of a, a, a sine curve, if we can hover much more oscillatingly around that x-axis of neutral, a lot better than, you know? And we may get pushed off of that pendulum swing, but not too far off, hopefully. We can bring it back. How do we constantly be aware that what we are going through is just what it is. Let's, let's minimize the severity of dukkha, minimize the experience of the quality of dukkha, and therefore hopefully bring a little more clarity to that veil. It's a lot easier said than done. Uh, I'll let you know when I get there. You know, maybe you can do the same for me when you when you too. Um, but I think the other part of the, the, the remaining three noble truths, I want to harp on the fact that there is a way out. We have tools. The Buddha then spent 80 years. Well, no, not 80 years. Uh, how, how many years? 40, 40 years. Thank 40, you. Yeah. Giving us tools. <laughs> Giving us the tools. So when we can start to label it and start to really work on it, face it, <clears throat> um, we can at least have a little less fear of it and start to maybe appreciate it a little bit more. Because it, it, if it is inevitable, we better get to know it. Because we generally don't. And you, at, at the, the bottom of your handout, this, this kind of explains a lot of it, which is, you know, at a certain point, uh, we we can ha we can ha choose to have a different experience of it of dukkha as we experience dukkha more fully. And when we see it in ourselves, we see it in others. And, and I would hope that at some point, that impulse of seeing that that dukkha in in ourselves and others helps our own bodhicitta in making the decision to do something about it. Uh, the last line is, uh, that is when, when what is expected as painful is fully understood, there is an experience beyond any pain as wisdom transforms how this is perceived. 
Thanks. So go do that. That'd be great. No, um, I'll open up for um, questions, comments. Need to go. Uh, yeah, uh, kind of if you could move it along. So yeah, as if there's nothing to talk about there. Um, I'll open it up and uh, or we can unmute next all those things. Oh, next, yeah, next slide, please. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Duca. Duca. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Only a little bit shows up, right? But if you're a rabbit, that's Duca. <laughs> or if you're swimming. Or if you're swimming. <laughs> um, yes, Brian, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, what I found helpful with Duca was through unattachment of expectations. Like, I, I'm not recommending this, but I once went on a date. And at one point in the date, we were talking, I said, no, I enjoyed walking to this restaurant. I'm enjoying talking to you. And I will enjoy equally walking back to the subway to go home. And I said, I'm not really concerned on whether or not we're going to have a second date which we didn't, by the way, I'm not recommending this. But <laughs> I said, I can be my authentic self by not thinking, oh, what do I have to be to make him like me? And do I really like him? And it was like, I still remember this. And it was more than 20 years ago because I've been married to another person for 20 years. And it clicked in me on that day that I made dates miserable by having by thinking of them as that this date's goal is to get date number two instead of just saying this date is what it is just be yourself and listen to what this man is saying to you and if another date happens it's good and if another date doesn't happen it's good and those two goods are equal and that don't prefer one good over the other. And that example, I then began to apply in other aspects of my life, like I'll get off the subway when I leave my office, and either there will be a bus there or there won't be a bus there, but I don't complain about no bus. I just say, it's no bus, okay. And it's just as good as there being a bus. And, if you, and the more you do it in everyday things, Really, Duca does go away because suddenly you're not attached to the outcome. You're attached to, um, you live your life and you say, a good moment is a moment when I've lived in accord with the Eightfold Path. A bad moment is when I haven't lived in accord with the Eightfold Path. And it's not about the outcome. It's about how I've dealt with the moment, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I feel like that. that's... That's um, very much how, yes, how we deal with the moment is, is, is kind of the crooks there. Because it's not just expectations. It's, it, you know, although, although expectations does go down, it, it, they're quite expensive. Uh, I, for example, I think of um, while driving, I have a lot of expectations. I have expectations that people are going to stay on their side of the street, their own side of the street. If they don't, like that. <laughs> We, can, we have to rely on some, some rely expectations on that. Um, that in and of itself uh, is not always, um, we, we can't always rely on those. Uh, but yes, Brian, thank you. That, that, that's a good observation. Um, any, anyone else? Thoughts or comments? Go, Joe. Yo. Yo. Kosi Sensei, thank you for uh, your talk. Um, you reminded me of uh, one of the movies that I watched a long time ago. And I would like you to comment on the relationship be between elimination of dukkha and elimination of pain. It seems to me that elimination of dukkha does not necessarily, you know, assume elimination of pain. In other words, and, and the movie that I, I'm thinking of is uh, that of uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, Shadowlands. Um, I, um, 
Anthony Hopkins uh, and uh, he, uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, he sees that uh, he, uh, the one whom he loves is dying. And then she says to him, the pain is part of the happiness. Uh, and so, uh, and that happiness and pain, they go together. And because you love has, hence you also feel the pain. Uh, and uh, the, the point is to accept the pain as part of life. Uh, and so, and the problem, and so elimination of dukkha does not necessarily mean that you eliminate also pain. Pain may be there as part of the human condition, but yes. the pro problem, is, but the challenge is to accept it as part of uh, the human condition. So, can you comment on the relationship between elimination of dukkha, diseaseness or suffering yeah. on the one hand, and the elimination of Pain. Yeah, I mean, I think you bring up a good point. Is it, the the oxymoron of eliminate the, the quest to eliminate dukkha when it is inevitable, right? So um, you're, you're right. You can't get rid of that type of that type of pain, right? It, it's endemic to life. Okay, um, but how much do we wallow in that pain? How, how much do we see it as as a matter of I love this person so much and therefore I am sad when they leave or they are gone. And that sadness is real in the same way that anger can, is, is very real. But how long do we let it change us or affect how we relate to the world? That, that's the degree to which dukkha is pervading into that, the quality of dukkha into that pain. Pain can be just that, just pain without a sense of dukkha. Pain is a type of dukkha, but I wouldn't say that pain is always having, having the same quality. Uh, uh, having, it doesn't always have to um, be, I should say, the experience of dukkha can be more, more intense than not. Please. I, I just want to respond. I, I think that Job's point is well taken. Um, and it reminds me of the C.S. Lewis in general. You know, you can't read C.S. Lewis and not be confronted with so many existential issues. Um, but I, I think that using the example that you were using from the film Shadowland was that in order to recognize the love, the pain amplifies that love. And one doesn't eliminate the dukkha, but through gratitude for the qualities that the protagonist had experienced, he was able to have a, a um, something that we talk about a lot, but often don't get to, and that is a sense of equanimity. There's a sense of equanimity when you realize that the pain that you're experiencing due to, the, in this case, the death of someone is only as a result of the love that was so incredibly present. And it's through gratitude that you can experience the equanimity. And I think that that's, that's really important. And, and therefore experience less dukkha. Right. And, and well, no, you're still experiencing the dukkha. Let's, yeah, yes. let's not think about not experiencing dukkha because you can't not, not experience, experience dukkha. But you can... Um, you can experience the totality, well, to go back to Chi Yi, samsara and nirvana are really one and the same. So the dukkha is part of the samsaric experience, and nirvana and samsara are not distinct. They're different, they're not different, they're distinct, they're not distinct. And I think that that's the, the, where we, we go into the notion of equanimity. What about when the pain is caused not from something like this great love that but he's dying for him? But when the pain is from war, like what's happening in Ukraine now or anywhere else, take it 10 other places in the world where the same thing is happening and we're not paying so much attention to it, um, you know, or anywhere else, or someone who is who is dying or 
the terrific pain, the physical pain, and it's not being relieved. I, I'm not sure how how this applies. Um, Why am I giving you the hard ones? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think. So in, in terms of going, when you're experiencing it, like a war, it, there's just, it, you, what you're saying is it's so insurmountable. Yeah, it, it's you, know, you can't see past it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's 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 not the same as the bus not coming or the children sure. screaming sure. because those are transitory. Sure, and and they're not in the same category at all. No, I would argue that that war also is transitory. Yeah, but it, it, it's more severe than a child crying. Right, right. It's still transitory, and and yet <clears throat> I think it's also um, this <clears throat> it helps us to feel it this far away. Well, it's not transitory for the people who are dying. No, though. no, no. Yeah, I mean, it's I, I, and so fine, it, it's it, no, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, it's, it's transitory if you look at it. And a whole. Sure. And I, I think, you know, all we can do is to be able to try to put, try to see it, see it as it is and tr see what we can do because of it. There's, a, you know, I, I have no major recourse for being able to go in and stop the Russian soldier. Um, but, you know, hopefully the craving to relieve suffering helps me to do what I can do as part of that, as a reaction to it. That's all that can for oneself be done, I suppose. Um, because it is inevitable, um, what are we to do? Or, or an individual say that is, you know, suffering great pain with mm. some disease or infirmity, you mm. know, that you're unable to, unable to believe. We face that. I mean, that's that's the duke of duca. You know, that is the the aspect of growing. Uh, uh, as Jane was saying, what are you bringing out this growing old stuff as a re as an issue? You know, um, but. Um, I think of of people in war, um, and I think of uh, a mother caring for her child as she's trying to become a refugee, trying to run away. Um, they are no doubt suffering. Right? They are no doubt experiencing dukkha. What happens when she is able to get her child to safety? There is still a glimmer of light. In, sorry, go ahead. no. no. I, I was just going to say, I think we're going in the wrong direction. Dukkha also involves things about which we can do nothing. It just plain sucks. There's no other way to put it. It's just it's a horrendous a <laughs> situation. It is not going to be relieved. That is also the nature of Dukkha. The nature we, of we deal with it as best we can, but... Sometimes dukkha is just dukkha, and there's not a heck of a lot you can do about it. And I think war is an example. And as Susan was pointing out, we can look at it, and we and I can say it's transitory because it will. I know everything is transitory to begin with. That's one of the three conditions of, of, of existence. It is transitory. On the other hand, you're right. It's not transitory. For the person who lost their child, it's not transitory for the person who has lost their homeland. For them, that's permanent, and that's dukkha as dukkha. And we have to realize that that exists. We cannot put a Hollywood ending on it. And maybe that's part of the problem, is that we're conditioned to think that we should have Hollywood endings. You know, it, and I think there's also an important distinction between dukkha if you're suffering yourself and if other people are suffering. And I think I'll make this very short, but it was a major lesson for me. I had a bone marrow transplant and I went into it 
knowing that I might die. Um, or and anyway, and so I prepared myself, did quite a preparation, um, to find it interesting. That's those are the words I used, that it was interesting. And when I was, they thought I was dying for four days. Um, <coughs> I was, I just didn't know, but I didn't need to know. And usually we need to know those things, but I worked very hard on it. And I remember the last night, the head of, the, one in the morning, the head of hematology oncology came by, which was not a good sign. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, and I said, do you think I'll make it through the night? And he said, well, I kind of needed him to stay. He said, I don't know. And I was really okay with not knowing him, but he, he sort of let me know that you confirmed that, I suppose, yeah. the way I heard it. And then I and I did live. But I think that's very different. I worked a lot with people in my practice, my psychotherapy practice, who had acute and chronic illnesses. And I I'm I kept two people, and one of them is dying now. And I saw many people, and that's different <laughs> when somebody else is dying. It's 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 I find it much easier to deal with my own dukkha than someone else's. And then when it's so, uh, I don't know if I, ambiguous isn't the word, but when it's people dying far away and horrible things are happening to them, you really feel helpless. At least in my practice, I could be there and try to help people think about their experience. But when you see these, these children and parents and dead bodies, that's a whole different experience. Okay, you're going to well, you know, a natural disaster isn't really a clear analog to like a conflict situation. But, um, you know, I lived in Oklahoma for a long time, and that was one of the major places that refugees from Hurricane Katrina came to. Not to mention like all the tornadoes and things like that. But I always remember a story that one of the uh, people who moved there from New Orleans told me. And he said that, you know, he, everything was destroyed pretty much in the area that he lived in. They were dealing with lack of utilities, uh, no way to really get food or like a lot of supplies and things like that. So it was a pretty horrible situation. But the thing that I found really interesting was he said he experienced something during that time that he'd never experienced before, which is that people who lived all up and down that block came out and started talking to each other. And somebody said, well, I have some things I can pitch in like, you know, I've got, I've got some coffee, I've got some eggs here, you know, we can combine this, we can bring this out. Hey, why don't you come over to like my place? Because it's like your roof is blown in, you know? And so that doesn't really take away from how horrible that situation is, but at the same time, it opens the possibility for positive experiences that you couldn't have had otherwise. Like, well, you, you could have technically. But it was it was that it was that suffering that they experienced as a group that really changed how they saw not only themselves but also other people. Yes, and I and I, you hear similar stories from uh, from you know wartime situations as well of people having extremely strong bonds that are built just because of what they've gone through together. That's not to say like this is great. I mean, it doesn't take away at all from how horrible it is. But it's that it's not like a monochromatic, horrible experience mm -hmm. that even even in the worst things that we can imagine, there are still like. There are still those moments where it's like the suffering is not constant. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see, Aaron, you have your hand up. Aaron and then Mushin. No, Mushin. Thank you, Mushin. Thank you. I was going to say that I thought of um, Dukkha as kind of a kind of a feature of being ignorant of ignorant in the form of bringing with it commitments to like substantial metaphysics so in some sense it's it's we may know things are impermanent but there's different ways we kind of make various commitments about in our actions and our beliefs towards the belief that there is some essence to things and those essence bring with them natures and i from what i understand it's sort of like um that's where the dependent origination pops in because that's how we kind of get ourselves looped into this whole like system of very of suffering of the various forms. They all kind of go back to that error at that metaphysical level. And then Nirvana is being aware of 
and having wisdom about that dependent origination. And that's the way in which there's an aspect of dukkha that is unconditioned. And that's also the source of the potential to become enlightened as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Moshi. Moshi, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, what about joy, happiness, and uh, you know, moments of bliss and those kinds of things? What, what about the... <laughs> I yeah, mean, yeah, have you yeah, experienced I mean, that? I, 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 yeah. Well, life, life is all just misery and suffering? No, no, no. Come on, that's no. not that's not what he's been saying. <laughs> no, I mean, look, um, I, I, I think I, there are obviously um, those moments of joy, and, and I guess all I'm saying is, in those moments of not joy, it's how we contextualize them. It's how what we can gain from them, um, and and but even you know, again, even with joy, the, the the cautionary tale is that we don't try to grasp at it so perfectly that we inherently generate the very dukkha we're trying to avoid. Um, but <clears throat> you know, of course there's joy. Yeah, of course there's happiness. Of course. It's a Shiva says, is there anything that you would like to say? Yes, the, those of us in person are going to be leaving in a moment. Is there anything that you would like to add to this? Well, I think dukkha and sukkha, it's, you know, it's a kind of the balancing. And the uh, <clears throat> cause of dukkha is our de- too much emotion and desires. So dukkha is supposed to be a cloud in the sky. Cloud brings us happiness sometimes, and sometimes storm, misery, etc. So how we evaluate uh, the things appears in our, in front of us, depending upon our what should I say consciousness, we can uh, change suffering to. Uh, joyfulness, uh, dukkha to sukkha. Uh, sukkha is the uh, opposite uh, term to the dukkha, and sukkavati is a uh, gokuraku, equivalent, etc. So these kind of things. Uh, when, in our <clears throat> life, uh, there are so many miserable things happening, and because that is uh, based upon, I think, uh, our desire, too much desire to destroy others, etc., and killing each other, that is terrible. These things are from our uh, such a too much desire. So how to stop some, such kind of things is kind of morality. And in the Buddha, uh, Buddhism, Eightfold Noble Truth shows how to look at it uh, properly, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. And is there some- I'm, and I'm, I'm going to say ciao, y'all, and uh, take the <laughs> folks in the house here into the hondo right now. Y'all are going to stay with stick so with me. People stay here, and uh, Proshin is going to complete the rest of the service online. Any other kind of thoughts, comments before we move on? Things you want to add? Or forever hold your peace. Good, great. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, uh, yeah, Brian. So, just again, emphasizing what you said at the end, in, in just in my experience, it, it's easy to, that learning that sometimes you that your own dissatisfaction, part of it is aversion. You you want to avoid these things, but I have made it myself not through the avoiding of the things, but through the grasping of the things that I thought were like the joy things. And that mm-hmm. it's it's kind of against Western American culture not to grab for the gusto or whatever the sweep we're supposed to be grabbing. And that that's just as bad. So you have to kind of train yourself both ways. That don't, you know, it's like, like, People said, weren't you disappointed by that? I said, well, it's it's not the last meal, the last movie, the last whatever I'm ever going to do. And if it is, I didn't know it was, so it still doesn't make any difference. Let's hope. Let's hope, right? (laughs) 
<laughs> and so it, it was what it was. And, and, you know, I'm on to the next thing hmm. that, you know, saying that, you know, that, I, but that was the <laughs> hardest thing for me, not to just stop looking to make everything a joyous or a good or a positive moment. Right. Yeah. And, I, I, and, I, I, I see that play out in, in um, a sense of self. Uh, we do what we like, it, well, it, and it's rampant in individualism in our culture, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is how we define ourselves, mm -hmm. um, and 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 we go, we we like the things that we like, we dislike what we dislike, and that's the way it is, as if that never changes, right? Um, we can't change our opinions on things, we can't be flexible, we can't allow, you know, we don't allow for change in that respect. Um, and, and we probably hold ourselves back from some really powerful fundamental change that may be necessary. But I, I think I always remember one of the first things that um, Monchi Sensei talked about. Uh, and, I th and I think even Shoshin, you were there, you were talking about like, I get, I get this point where I, I do the practice, I'm trying to dissolve the sense of self. And as soon as I get there, man, does it rebel against it, right? As if the, the self, oh, as soon as you start to kind of see through the little, like see through, the, it clamps down right back uh, uh, harder onto it. Um, and, and I think by its very nature, we are, it, it, is, it is a fearful process um, because it is completely unexpected. There is no frame of reference. We have no, no expectations, right? We get outside of those, those spheres of comfort. Um, I mean, I, I feel like uh, in a psychological sense, if we're all those scared little children deep down inside ourselves, um, we just build up the layers of the onion as means of def defense mechanisms against it. Right. And so we try to peel away those layers of the onion, but inevitably we just like we have to have them there to uh, deal. Deal. Oh, gosh, I could go on. What, what else? Before we move on to, to service. Yeah, Shoshin. Did um, this kind of came to my mind um, uh, when um, Brian was just talking? Did somebody say, and uh, that dukkha is part of nirvana. I mean, I, I, I guess just, you know, in a, in a general type of ideology in my mind, I think nirvana is the abs, you know, when you're able to let go of it. So I got to think about that more. I, th I thought I heard somebody say that dukkha is part of nirvana, that which kind of like shook me up and i think brian was just talking about that a little bit what do you yeah i mean in so much as is uh in an, in an absolute sense um it, anything that is um anything that is not nirvana is dukkha um and and so the absence of dukkha would logically be nirvana um we could <laughs> because because of what chi describes in two truth the two truths are one truth which is like dukkha and nirvana are one and the same they 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 are two sides of the same coin in the same way that i can experience dukkha and say oh but instead of dukkha i'm going to say no I, i'm going to i'm going to learn something from this experience and have something joyful come out of it um in the same way that there is happiness and joy and there is some suffering in that within that um or stress or pain or however you want to characterize dukkha um, that they go, I see it as a, like a yin-yang symbol. And the yin-yang symbol in my mind is not two-dimensional, it's three-dimensional. And that they're all feeding on each other and they just self-perpetuate. But they're, but they're the same, they're the manifestations of the same thing. Um, but I, <laughs> like you're saying, it, we can't really either, we can't eliminate it either. So what is that? Um, what would that nirvanic state be like? But that's... Again, when I get when I get there, you know, maybe I'll let you know. <laughs> like, let's, oh, Aaron, yeah, you know. and then and then we'll move on to service here. The way I think about it is that nirvana <laughs> is unconditioned. Yes. And by definition, if it's unconditioned, it has to be everywhere because otherwise it would be conditioned. Sorry. Therefore, it must also be in nirvana. I'm sorry, in dukkha as well. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. There is a seed of that. Right. Right. And in the if, right and in, and in the same in the polar opposite. Um, uh, you know, I, I really like that idea the, the, that it was through Shakyamuni's dukkha that made him realize that that's what he wanted to go do. You know, 
Okay. All right. Uh, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So much. So much. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, we are going to be moving on right into um, the service portion of this evening. So what? Where do we take um, all this discussion of eliminating or at least minimizing uh, dukkha? Frankly, to whatever end you choose. Um, that's. I give, I give the information. You do with it what you will. But. We don't have to look far to, um, and we don't have to look far to find examples of those who have taken the, the pursuit of uh, alleviating suffering wholeheartedly. Um, some have taken it up uh, to such an extent to the, to the great sacrifice of themselves. And the relief of our one's own dukkha is, is one thing, but that of others as well. Uh, I mean, no offense. I just, I don't, I got my hands full personally. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot to consider, you know? Um, I mean, I guess I'm doing this type of thing. I'll, I'll help the person cross the street, uh, you know, if, if they're elderly, think that kind of thing. but that's about it. That's all you get from me. You know, I got my hands full. On the other hand, what my dukkha is, is not that separate from yours or all of yours. I, for one, experience dukkha, uh, other people's dukkha all the time. Um, we experience the dukkha of a loved one, uh, of our community, uh, even for what's going on in other parts of the world. We are actually hardwired to empathize. Um, there are empathy neurons. I, I, I touch my hand, and your brain sees me touch my hand, and the sensory part of your brain that is your hand lights up as if your hand was being touched. So you see pain and your mind fires in your, in your mind. It fires in a place that is similar to you experiencing that pain. And when um, now that dukkha is being shared, we cannot allow perceived separateness to limit our ability to help. But as discussed earlier, facing dukkha is hard. Uh, the experience may be difficult, definitely uncomfortable, but the relief of pain, the relief of dukkha is worth it. Even if you're only to alleviate your own, at least that's one less contributor. <laughs> but, if you still but you still have to face it, observe it, and let it go for yourself and for all sentient beings. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. You quote, do that. You, you gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look at fear in the face. You are able to say to yourself, I have lived through this horror. I can take the next thing that comes along. You must do the thing that you think you cannot do. 